love, my friend, does not win. Think about it. If love wins, then everybody would go to heaven because God sent his greatest gift. Love doesn't win. Truth wins. Thank you for tuning in to the Removing Barriers podcast. I'm Jay. And I'm MCG. And we're attempting to remove barriers so we can all have a clear view of the cross. This is episode number eight of the Removing Barriers podcast. This is a third in the series of Black Lives Matter and its mission. The first in the series was episode number three, Introduction to the Movement, and episode number four, The Destruction of the Nuclear Family. Those episodes can be found on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and other places where podcasts can be found. In this episode, we'll be talking about Black Lives Matter and the LGBTQIA community. This is a heavy topic, so we brought in a heavy hitter. Jay, introduce our guest. Our guest today is Todd, and he is a pastor, husband of 28 years, and a father. And uh, he's been pastoring for the past 18 years and currently pastoring in the eastern part of the U.S. here, not too far from the nation's capital, and uh, we're very happy to have him here. Pastor Todd, welcome to the Removing Barriers podcast. Glad to be here with you guys tonight. Great. All right, so as I said, we'll be talking about Black Lives Matter and the LGBT community. The LGBT community is a community that if you have anything to say, whether it's biblical or not, you have to say with a little bit more grace because it tends to cause people to be canceled. It tends to cause people to be lose their jobs, depends on what you are saying. The LGBT community is strongly pushed by the Black Lives Matter movement. So, Jay, what do you think? Do you think the LGBT community has anything to do with Black Lives Matter movement or why are they pushing it? Uh, I think it, it's tough because uh, in many ways, uh, the whether you're whether you're homosexual or queer, that has become the new so-called black. That's the new civil rights hot button topic. And so it falls under the umbrella of civil rights. It falls on the, uh, under the umbrella of individual liberty and rights and everything. And so that is why Black Lives Matter and the LGBTQIA community can marry up so well. They will push that sort of agenda with that same sort of idea with the thrust of the civil rights act. Right. Or the they, they're conflating, them. they're conflating your skin color, which cannot be changed with the fact that they're homosexual, which apparently cannot be changed. So they say, and so what we're hoping to do today is to see what the, what does the Bible have to say about that? Well, talking about the Bible, let's go to the pastor. Pastor is homosexuality a sin and why? Well, I believe that we have to choose a different starting point, to be honest with you. And I think we have to go back to the Word of God, and the starting point would be found in Matthew chapter 19, when the Lord was speaking to a group of individuals, and he answered them, and he was quoting from the book of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. And in Matthew 19, in verse number 4, he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he, which is speaking of Almighty God, which made them at the beginning, made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. So I believe that the starting point is the question, how did we get here? Did we get here, as the Bible says, under the direct act of God, where God says he made them in the beginning male and female, or did we arrive here by chance? A major explosion, a big bang, resulted in uh, order and the, the evolutionary process, and then through the evolutionary process and millions of years, we evolve into mankind, and therefore I, because I'm the product of chance, can choose whatever direction I want in life. There was no direct designer, there's no direct creator, and so I can choose what I want to be in my sexuality. Uh, and we're seeing this unfold very rapidly, and it's moving very quickly from just wanting 
to be a homosexual to uh, now adding multiple other letters there uh, in which young people are now trying to say that they're no gender. And so the starting point really for me and the foundation that I would have is that we are the direct product of an intellectual creator. And he designed us to be male or female. And he did not make a mistake in how he created us. And so that, for me, I believe that that's the starting point because if you start with, uh, I'm a homosexual, it doesn't reflect the truth of how we got here. And I would say to everyone that would ask me that we're the product of an intelligent designer and that we'll give an account one day to that creator and therefore we're not the product of chance. Therefore, we cannot choose to be something other than how the creator made us. So how would you respond to someone who say, I was born that way? Well, that's that's an interesting question because I do think that uh, that is becoming a more and more popular uh, statement, and it's primarily becoming a popular statement because uh, it is an offense for the minorities who were born with a certain skin color to have themselves compared to people that are making a choice with their life. And so in order for them to have as great of an argument in the arena of public opinion, then they have to prove that they are not by choice homosexual, but they're just the product of uh, their birth. Again, I would go to the Word of God, and I do not believe that the Bible says and teaches that a person is born that way. Uh, I believe time and again the Bible demonstrates that it is a choice. Genesis chapter 19 reveals that an entire city made the choice to give themselves over to homosexuality. Uh, Judges chapter 19 reveals to us that an entire city made the choice to give themselves over to homosexuality. Romans chapter 1 seems to indicate to us that when people have rejected the natural direction and uh, intellect that God has put within them, that they then choose to go to that furthest point away from that creator. And the furthest point away from their creator is the refusal to act on the gender in which God created them. And so the Bible says they were given the opportunity to know God, but they've rejected God. And out of that comes uh, man uh, participating in sexual acts with man and woman participating in sexual acts with women. So we can see clearly from scripture that homosexuality is definitely not biblical. So what about transgenderism? Because a lot of folks will say, okay, I get it. The Bible speaks against homosexuality, but does the Bible speak against being transgender? Well, again, that's that's a great, great point. And that's kind of where the shifting philosophy uh, just seems to move on us all the time. But if I come back to an understanding that I'm the direct product of an intelligent designer, and according to Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse number 5, God knew all that there was to know about me while I was in, in the womb and conceived of his miraculous work. And the Bible says there in Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5 that he knew Jeremiah while he was in the womb. We also go to Psalm 139, and we find that, that God demonstrates in Psalm 139 that he's made us exactly how he desired for us to be. And so the Bible says that we are uh, we're marvelously created. Uh, fearful and wonderful are thy works, I think the Bible says, um, and that my soul knoweth right well. And so the Bible indicates that I've been created in a very special way, and it wasn't a mistake. Tragically, in our society today, we look at kids that deal with uh, mental issues and and, um, if they were born with with, uh, health issues and so forth, we look at all of those as defects uh, from the creator or from evolution, I should say. But in truth, 
they're actually meant to glorify Almighty God. In John chapter number 9, a man was born uh, blind, and the disciples asked him in John chapter 9, he said, who did sin, this, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? Well, I think we would all agree that the issue of blindness is a definite difficulty and a definite hardship on an individual. But Christ said, this man was not born blind because of the sin of his parents or the sin of his own life. He was born blind for the glory of God. And we find that God caused him to have sight. And when God brought sight, the Bible says, of course, as you read through John chapter 9, uh, that he brought glory to the Lord Jesus Christ in his sight. Um, I went back to Psalm 139 and verse number 14 because I wanted to read it. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. So the indication is all the way back in Psalm 139 that we're conceived and created by Almighty God, and he knows everything about us from the moment of conception. And if I could go back to the previous question that you asked about whether or not we're born this way, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter number uh, 6 that there were individuals in the church at Corinth that had participated in homosexual activities. And they, uh, it says, be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And then the Bible says this statement, and such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified. The point is, we're all born as sinners. But if what they're saying is true about their sin, they'd never be able to enter heaven if they were born that way. Yeah, that's a good the point. The Bible says clearly these individuals will not inherit eternal life. And so for the individual that's chosen to walk down the path of homosexuality uh, and anything in that arena, a transgenderism, all those kinds of things are active defiance against the Creator God. And the Bible says that those individuals will not be able to inherit eternal life unless they come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. So in saying that they're born that way, they would be making a statement such as this, I was born in such a way as to preclude my ability in going to heaven. And the truth of the matter is from Scripture, there's just no such thing. Yes, we're sinners, but Christ died for our sin. And we can have that sin forgiven, but he did not create me in such a way as to make me precluded from going to heaven. That was going to be the next question I would ask you, Pastor, because um, even within some Christian circles, some Christian circles, they would say something along the lines of, oh, well, the LGBTQIA many in that community say that they are born that way. And so we could roll with that because, hey, we're all born in sin, right? We all have a propensity to sin, right? So yeah, sure, you were born that way. And my question was going to be, is that sort of thing normal? Um, homosexuality, transgenderism, being queer or questioning, is it normal? And it sounds like you're saying that, no, that's not normal. You aren't born that way because if you were, you're pretty much, um, and I, I don't know if I'm using too strong a word, but irredeemable pretty much because those people will not inherit the kingdom of God? Well, according to this, all, according to the word of God, all of us are sinners. Right. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, I may not have the sin of homosexuality, but I have sin in my life. I may not have the sin of theft at the moment or the sin of murder at the moment or the sin of drunkenness at the moment. The truth is that I could participate in any one of those, and it's still sin, but the Bible says that I must repent of my sin and put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ mm -hmm. for salvation. Well, if I was born a drunkard, 
and had no say in choosing that, and I was born a uh, a thief and, and a murderer and so forth. You see, I'm born in sin, but the individual will make the choice to participate uh, and to follow up on their sin. So let me give you an example. When I was born, my parents never sat me down and said, now, Todd, we want to teach you how to lie. They never sat me down and they, they never said, now, Todd, this is how you steal. My sin nature worked in me and said, you're going to follow this path because the Bible says, John 8, 44, I'm in the family of Satan before salvation. Mm-hmm. And so the Bible says the lust of our flesh we will do. We don't have an inward abiding Holy Spirit, which comes after salvation. And so we're following after the the appetites of our flesh. And uh, homosexuality is born out of following the appetites of the flesh. And it leads me away from the truth of Scripture. And again, it really seems to be one of the last indications of the rejection of the knowledge of God that he has put within all of us. And again, Romans chapter 1 says, when man rejected the, the, the convicting influence of God Almighty, that God from creation put within them, when they reject that and they go their own way, the Bible indicates or seems to indicate that one of the primary things that they choose to do in their life is to follow a path in homosexuality. And they, the, uh, I can turn over to the passage, but it says that they begin to work which that is, uh, work that which is not seemly, uh, it is not natural because they, they've rejected Almighty God. And the Bible says there that, um, God gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. And the Bible says, and likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman, Burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. And so, uh, it is, uh, it does seem to be an absolute rejection of the knowledge of God. They, they did not want to retain the knowledge of God in their mind. So, Pastor, you're using a lot of scriptures. Could the Bible be wrong on homosexuality and the scientists? correct in this matter well again i i would go to the word of god and i would i would seek to find answers from within the bible as to whether or not it's telling me the truth and i believe that we would have to put on a scale the decision to follow finite man so the average man is going to live for 70 to 90 years and they're going to accumulate a certain amount of knowledge they're going to receive training. They're going to be possibly professors and scientists and and uh, smart individuals. But there's always going to be a capacity to their to their. There's always going to be a end capacity to their knowledge because they're finite and they have a starting point and an ending point. The difference between man and Almighty God is that God has no beginning because He is eternity past. And he has no future, he has no ending, because he's eternity future. And so if I put on one side of the scales, finite man, as smart as he may be, on the other side of the scale, I have an infinite God. And the infinite God says this, in Titus chapter 1, it says in verse number 2, that in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie, promised before the world began. And so God has declared that there is no ability within him to lie. And so we read the Word of God and we understand the Word of God, that it stands the test of time. It applies to all people in all places at all times. And he tells the truth. I heard a preacher say the other day about 1 Timothy chapter 3, He said from 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 1, this is a true saying. And he just emphasized that point again and again and again by demonstrating that there are many people 
that are saying the opposite of what First Timothy chapter 3 says. But he emphasized again and again, what does the Bible say? It says this is a true saying. What does it say? This is a true saying. So any statement in opposition to what the Bible says in First Timothy chapter 3 is a lie. And, and again, the people in the time of Christ tried to demonstrate that Christ was lying, and they tried to trap him, they tried to tell everybody that he was a liar, and uh, Jesus Christ said time and again, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and he said it in a number of different ways, but he emphasized, I am telling you the truth. And again, on that side of the scale, we have an infinite God who has no beginning and has no end. And so I trust what God says about it. He cannot lie. Yeah, definitely. So on the Black Lives Matter website, which they have since um, removed, they had what we believe, and they had a long um, section there on what they believe. And part of it reads, We are self-reflective and do the work required to dismantle cisgender privilege and uplift black trans folks especially black trans women who continue to be disproportionately impacted by trans antagonistic violence. We foster a queer-affirming network. When we gather, we do so with the intention of freeing ourselves from the tight grip of heteronormative thinking, or rather, the belief that all in the world are heterosexual, unless he, she, or they disclose otherwise. This is the Removing Barriers podcast. We will be right back. Antivirus software protects you from malware. But to protect your privacy and security on the web, you need a virtual private network or VPN. Did you know that Ivacy offers an easy to use VPN app for each of your favorite devices? From Windows, Macs, and smartphones to smart TVs, tablets, and browser extensions, and even gaming consoles. Get Ivacy for your choice of devices to secure your connection, browse with privacy, and access content from anywhere in the world. Go to ivacy.com or click the link in the show notes. Use coupon code Removing Barriers for a 20% discount. How would you respond to that section of the Black Lives Matter What We Believe? If I could, if I could maybe expand it a little bit and emphasize that I've been given the privilege of interacting with people from all different cultures and countries and skin color. And the truth of the matter is that I had no say in my birth being that of white skin. <laughs> Individuals that are born with black skin, to my knowledge, had no idea that they were going to be born with black skin. Individuals with red skin or yellow skin had no idea that they were going to be born with that kind of skin. I would take personal offense to the statements that say that my skin color, in which we had no choice, is the same equivalent as someone who has definitively made a choice to go against God and to go against his word and against the way that he created them. You see, I think we're all specially created. We're all unique. I'm glad that everyone doesn't look like me. I'm glad too, Pastor. (laughs) If you travel the world and you interact with cultures and languages and skin colors, There are so many wonderful differences between all of us. And and God did not make robots. He didn't make us without the ability to choose and the ability to uh, be what he'd have us to be, but he uniquely created every single one of us. And so I think there's a couple things that are true. Number one, I would take offense when people equate a visible choice to my skin color, because I didn't have a choice on the skin color. So I would take offense at that. And then I, I really disappointed because they've lost their uniqueness as God created them. And so in trying to make themselves something they're not, they've lost 
all that God wanted to accomplish with their life uh, because they've chosen to reject the speciality of how he created them. And so I, I just, um, I recognize as, as again, it's, it's interesting when you travel to countries where there are individuals who want the whitest skin that they can have because they don't want anyone to ever think that they are a common laborer that works outside. And so, so they elevate the whitest skin possible. And then you come to other countries where uh, the whitest skin is going out and sitting in the sun for the longest period of time because they want to get dark skin. And uh, it's just amazing that we find individuals that are just not content with the way that God created them. So this is and, a personal uh, acceptance. What he had designed for their lives, if that, if that makes sense. Right. Do you think this is more of personal acceptance of who you are, of who God made you to be? Rather than I'm I'm gay I'm homosexual I'm lesbian. Well, again, I would go back to the Word of God and I would say that they've made a choice to go into that lifestyle. And I know that, that statement is not going to be popular, so whoever hears this podcast is not happy with the statement that I've just made. But I'm saying to you, based upon the authority of the Word of God, so your problem is not with me. Your problem is your need to reconcile with Almighty God in the way that He created you. Society has in many ways created this attitude that we should not be content with how God created us. And while I agree that we should do all we can to keep up our bodies, so we should exercise, we should eat right, we should care for ourselves, we should get good rest, all those things are true. The point of the matter is that the world is so emphasizing that the outside is the only important thing. And so people spend all their time trying to change that to make it more appealing to people that they're going to interact with. And God says, I'm focused on the heart. And I want you to have the right heart. And so God can use people of every color. God can use people of every nationality and every language. And uh, he created us with a special, unique, wonderful design in mind. Pastor, you mentioned in the answer to one of the previous questions, when MCG asked you, can the Bible be wrong? And you said that it's not possible because on one hand, if you were to compare and put them on scales. On one hand, you have finite man that has at, at the most 90 or so years under his belt and an infinite God on the other side that cannot lie. Um, so we would take God's word for it. And so we have this infinite God who has given us this infallible word. And my question to you is, if we were to like condense it into a bottle and use it as an antidote to everything that we are hearing and seeing from the world, what does the Bible say about human sexuality then, coming from this infinite God, the one who cannot lie, who's given us this infallible word, and as an antidote to all of this stuff that we're hearing about the malleability of our gender and our their our ability to choose our sexuality what does the what does the bible say about human sexuality well uh, the bible is the manual on human sexuality so god created man god created marriage and god is the one who ordained for them to have physical intimacy so the rejection, the interesting thing, again, if I go back to Matthew chapter 19, have you not read in the beginning that he which made them, I'm sorry, have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? So he made them male and female. He created them to complete one another. And in that completion, the male is not like the female. The female is not like the male, but together they're complete. And the Bible says, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. It's interesting to note that before sin entered the picture, in Genesis chapter 3, the Bible says at the end 
of Genesis chapter 2 that they were both naked. So what we're saying is, and I want to be careful in how I say this because I don't think we have to be crude in our description, but Adam knew every day that there was a difference in Eve's body. Eve knew every day that there was a difference in Adam's body. But the Bible says they were naked and not ashamed. Why weren't they ashamed? Because sin had not brought shame upon their lives. And so God created man, God created woman, and God is actually the author of physical intimacy. And he designed physical intimacy to be within the bounds of marriage and to be a protectorate against all of these diseases that we see. He, he designed it to be a protectorate against uh, uh, societal issues where a person is going from one person to another, to another, to another. Um, he, he designed the bounds of marriage to be a protectorate of society. But it's interesting because I think sometimes Christians run from any talk of physical intimacy when the truth of the matter is that God is the one that designed it. He's the one that created it. And he created men for women and women for men. And he designed for them to go and get married and participate to the fullest in their physical intimacy. And, uh, and it's just, it's an amazing, it's an amazing completion to the marriage bond, that physical union that you enjoy with your spouse that you have with no one else. So you've never had that physical union with a mom, a dad, a brother, a sister, a cousin, an aunt, an uncle, any other relationship, but you have the relationship of the husband and wife that has that unique bond. So basically you're saying that all sexual activity outside of a committed marriage between a man and a woman is sin. Well, that's how the Bible describes it. So the Bible breaks it down for us in a couple of different words, and it uses the word first fornication, which is all kinds of sexual activity outside of the bounds of marriage. And then the Bible secondarily uh, highlights adultery, which is sexual activity outside of marriage. Or, I mean, sexual sexual activity with someone that is not your spouse. Right. And so adultery is a little bit narrower than the issue of fornication, if I'm saying that accurately. Right. Let's shift gears a little bit and go back to, to gender issues. So a lot of folks today will say that, okay, I understand that there are only two sex, male and female. However, gender, I can define my gender. How many genders are there? I was looking at uh, an article, I think it was on Tumblr, and they were saying there were, they were up to 112 different genders. How would you respond to that? Well, Again, if our foundation is what the Bible says, the Bible says that in the beginning he made them male and female. He created two genders. What about sexual abnormalities? Well, I, I, there are abnormalities that will play a part, but they're not uh, for our good. So, for example, I, when I was a youngster growing up in, in elementary school, we had a girl in our uh, school that had two pinkies. Oh, wow. So on one hand, she had six fingers, and that's that's not a that's not a norm. Something happened in that mutation. That's from the time of birth, and you see from Genesis chapter two when Adam and Eve were created in the garden in perfection, they transitioned into chapter three, and the Bible says that Eve was deceived by Satan. And that Adam willfully chose to take a bite of the forbidden fruit. And therefore sin through Adam has passed upon all mankind. So when you and I see sexual abnormalities, it's not directly related to the nature of our God and his desire for uh, us 
but it's a part of our fallen race. And so it's a part of the sin uh, nature, the, the nature of our fall from perfection. And these mutations are not mutations that are beneficial. They're actually harmful uh, and difficult for us to address and deal with. Um, I, I've been in some African countries where uh, individuals are um, the product of, of some inbreeding that will go on in many of the tribes. And from that inbreeding where individuals were too closely related and they had children together, uh, they would give birth to albinos. And so you're walking down a street and, and you're in the middle of a, of a hut setting or a city setting in Africa and you see uh, an albino. Well, that, that is not a, not a norm, but it's something that comes to us because of our fallen race and the effects that the fall of Adam has had upon creation. And the Bible says that all of, of, um, the creation groans because of the nature of Adam's sin. And so I would point to the scriptures and I'd say that we have these deformities and we've had, we have these abnormalities, uh, because of the nature of sin. Yeah, so what about the different, even want to call it denomination, um, sets of Christianity that do not believe like you do? There's some, there's some churches, you know, if you just drive, you know, a few miles from where, wherever we live, we'll see churches waving their, the rainbow flag and waving the Black Lives Matter flag. What about those Christians that don't believe the way you do? Well, you know, I, I can't personally convince them. I just have to keep taking them to the Word of God and seeking to live by what the Bible says. In my own personal life, I would try to direct the individual to a more thorough understanding of what the Scriptures present, and I would desire to see them go to the Bible and see themselves as they are before a holy God, and see them make the right choice because they are directly accountable to God and not to me. So there are a lot of people in religion that disagree with the statement that I'm going to make right now. Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. There are a lot of people that practice religion that disagree with that statement. And they would say, no, there are many roads that lead to heaven. There are, you know, you, you call yourself this, I call myself this, but in the end, we'll all find our way to some kind of heaven or heavenly dwelling place. When, again, the Bible says that there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So I would just seek to drive them back to the Bible and what it, what it says. And then their, their issue is with Almighty God, not with me. Right. And in other words, the authority is not the Bible. A lot of these churches, they have different authorities in terms of maybe someone over them or even whatever society is pushing currently. Yes, exactly. Agreed. Agreed. So there are some religions that teach that I, as a religious leader, can receive visions from God. And when I receive those visions, that those visions are on par with whatever the Bible says, and they, in some cases, replace what the Bible says. Whereas I would believe that the Bible is complete, and man cannot add to it, and man should not take away from it. I should, I should read the Bible, study the Bible, look at what it says, look at it in context, and consider how it applies to all people in all places at all times. This is the Removing Barriers podcast. We will be right back. Crossflix is a family-friendly channel with thousands of Christian films, including Christian movies, new releases, documentaries, and educational content. You can access the videos through their digital streaming network anytime, day or night. Whenever you watch a Christian video from Crossflix, you can feel confident that your family is watching inspiring, uplifting content that is clean and curated. For a limited time, Crossflix is available for the first 30 days for free, and you can cancel any time, no questions asked. That's right! Get access to thousands of free Christian movies and Christian music online right now with your 30-day trial. 
Click on the link in the description section of this podcast to get CrossFlix today. Pastor, I'm going to ask you a question that I need to expand or qualify first. There is a, um, I don't know if she's famous, but uh, she certainly made waves recently when she published either a book or a report saying that the LGBTQIA community is much more open and loving toward people than the Christian community is. And if Christians really want to win people, they're going to have to be more loving than the LGBTQIA community. And um, that's what she said. And then we've also seen on the worldly front, the what I would say is the worldly front, the, the contemporary Christian music front, you've had a lot of people who profess to be Christians, but have come out as openly gay or openly queer or transgender. And when they're interviewed about their experiences, they always say something along the lines of, oh, well, you know, the Christian community is not as loving as they say. Um, people don't call me anymore now that I've come out. And they go on to talk about how unloving the Christian community is. Now, when they speak, it sounds to me like they're confusing what love actually is. It sounds like they're saying, if you really loved me, you would accept me as I am, and you wouldn't talk about the clear uh, mandates and the clear direction we see in scripture. You would just love me as I am because that's what Jesus would do. And so there seems to be this confusion about what love is. And so my question to you is, does the LGBTQ community want acceptance or tolerance? And how, how can Christians, um, combat that negative stereotype in the community that we're unloving because we will tell them the truths of scripture? Well, I think we follow the example of Christ where Christ dealt with the woman at the well in John chapter four. So Christ's desire for the woman at the well was not just to get out of the relationship that she was in with a man that was not her husband. Christ's desire was for her to be saved, to be converted. I think we've done ourselves a disservice as believers in the way that we've talked about people that have chosen a lifestyle that is contrary to the Word of God. So when I'm caring about in the average day of society, if I'm interacting with an individual that uh, has chosen a homosexual lifestyle, I've got two choices. I can berate them in front of society and call them names and everything like this, or I can present to them the love of Christ, and I can tell them that there is an answer for their eternal life. Their primary need is to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. But I don't think we've done ourselves a great service in all the name-calling that we've had and all the ways that we've been so derogatory. It's interesting that the most derogatory that Christ ever was with individuals was not with the individual that would be known as kind of the the community center, but the most scathing statements that Christ made against individuals was against the religious crowds and those that claimed to be speaking on his behalf when in truth they were speaking error. But when you see Christ dealing with the Zacchaeuses of the world and you see Christ dealing with the woman at the well, he doesn't call them names. He doesn't call them, you know, different uh, items related to the choices that they were making in life. No, he stays on topic and goes directly to what their primary need is. Their primary need is to know Lord Jesus Christ. And we've almost presented it to the world as though these people need to clean up their lives so that they're then worthy of trusting Christ as their Savior. Mm. When the truth of the matter is that I want to present Christ to a lost and dying world, and I want them to be saved, and then we work from there because they have the Holy Spirit indwelling them, and the Holy Spirit will help them fight their battle against the flesh. 
And I hope that makes sense. I, I just, I think we can, we can demonstrate love like Christ did, but we can also hold the truth. Um, and Christ gives us the example too, where people mocked the message of the truth. And so Christ tells the disciples, if that's what you get when you enter the city, then dust off your feet and move on to the next city. And, uh, and I, I think that's where we have to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves in discerning if these people genuinely want to know the truth. So therefore it's a balance between grace and truth. At some point you have to. Well, it is. And, and if I could just insert this and this boy, this won't be popular <laughs> with some in the Christian, I'll call it the pop Christian world. But there was a book that was recently put out called Love Wins. And there were Christians that were falling all over themselves, and I don't remember the name of the author, but it's not that old of a book. And he entitled it Love Wins, and I beg to differ. The Bible does not say that love wins. If love wins, then everybody will go to heaven because there's no love that is supreme to God's love. Hmm. And he said in John chapter 3 and verse number 16, for God, the Father, so loved the world, that you and I, that he gave his only begotten son. There's never been a greater demonstration of love than the love that the, son, the father sent, or that the father gave in sending his son. But love, my friend, does not win. Think about it. If love wins, then everybody would go to heaven because God sent his greatest gift. Love doesn't win. Truth wins. And in the end, based upon truth and the acceptance or the rejection of truth, there will be a determination as to whether or not the person goes to heaven or goes to hell. And so it's a false statement to make the statement that love wins. It does not. Truth wins and truth prevails. And so sometimes the most loving thing that I can do is to share the truth with that person that doesn't yet know Christ. So is it is it loving for me to go to the doctor and for the doctor to run tests and to find out that I'm full of cancer and the doctor doesn't tell me and doesn't show me the way that I can deal with it, that I can address it or whatever? So, oh, that would be loving if he just let me walk away thinking that everything was fine. No, when the doctor tells me the truth, that's the best scenario. He could tell me anything he wanted and say, well, I didn't want to, I didn't want to say those things because, because I love him too much. Well, no, if I have a lost friend and I love them, then I will want to tell them the truth. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. And I think a lot of times going back to what it are homosexual community want tolerance or acceptance. I think a lot of times they want acceptance because they figure that anything else is not loving. And you that make a, a very good point saying mm-hmm. truth wins. I think that's the title of your next book, Pastor. <laughs> well, truth wins. Say, you know, if I could write, if I was a uh, an author, I, I just was, I was very heartbroken because when people heard that statement, they just fell all over themselves and, and followed the premise of the book. It was a bestseller. Christians just flock to it. And I, I thought to myself, wait a minute, love doesn't win. Uh, the Bible says in First Peter that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Well, that verse demonstrates that God desires for everyone to go to heaven. Hell was never designed for mankind. But when mankind chose to disobey God, there had to be an eternal dwelling place. And the fact of the matter is that that eternal dwelling place was created for the devil and his angels. Hmm. But God will be true to his word, and all that accept Jesus Christ will go to heaven. God will be true to his word. All that reject Jesus Christ and his salvation will be lost in their sins, and they will die and go to hell. That is the truth, and that is the the very loving step that I can take with any kind of a friend, relative, neighbor, associate to tell them of their greatest need. Definitely. 
what are some of the dangers to the advancement of the LGBTQIA plus community? To think about it, what are the dangers of this community to the church, to the country, to a society of a whole? Well, you put yourself in direct opposition to Almighty God. And according to the scriptures, God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because of their adherence to homosexual lifestyles. And so the first thing that I would say is you put yourself in direct opposition to the way that God created you and the way that God designed marriage. The second thing is that you undermine future potential societies. So when when we stepped out in, in the recent, not, it's not recent now because it's been a number of years, but when the Supreme Court opened Pandora's box and said that marriage was no longer between one man and one woman, when they moved beyond that premise of one man, one woman, they opened Pandora's box, and it's just a matter of time before the decadence of society takes over and has some older man marrying some young girl. In fact, they've just now, in the state of California, been debating as to whether or not they're going to have such a criminalized act of uh, child molestation. Oh, wow. And whether or not that an individual that's 24 can be uh, physically intimate with someone that's 14. And so when they created the premise that our marriages will now base, be based upon whoever we love, and it went outside of one man and one woman, then we're going to see the craziest of things, and that's undermining to the future of society. Because eventually it begins to take its toll, and, tr- and tragically, we have kids that are growing up in a society today, and they don't know which end is up. They they. They don't know what gender they are. They don't know who to call mom and who to call dad. And uh, it's so sad that, that they live under such doubt when in truth God is the designer of removing doubt and God wants us to live without fear. And so, uh, number one, I put myself in direct opposition to the way that God made me. Number two, I undermine what God designed for my uh, society and for our repopulation of the earth. And then uh, it's also another thing is if everybody made this choice of lifestyle and you had no heterosexuals, it's not that long before you have no children, you have no offspring. So that's, that's not how God designed us. God designed us to be fruitful and to multiply. How would you respond to someone who say that, hey, based on all you have just said, you hate the LGBTQIA community? Well, I, I don't know that I can, you know, that I could ever verbally convince them. Um, they would just have to see how I've lived my life. And uh, I don't seek to be a jerk uh, to anyone based upon race, color, or creed, or even act and choice. So... I want to see them come to know Jesus Christ, and that's my ultimate goal. But again, I want to drive them to the Word of God so that they clearly understand that one day they'll give an account, not to me, they'll give an account to Almighty God. And so at different times, I've been introduced to homosexual couples, and I'm not a jerk. I greet them like I should, and uh, we interact. Uh, I've been in a, uh, I've physically been in a country where Transgenderism is very popular, and um, the the churches in that country are doing their very best to reach those people uh, that have made those choices. And the bottom line is they need the Lord Jesus Christ. He hung on the cross, and I go back to Corinth. Corinth was one of the most uh, rapidly advanced sinful cities in the ancient world. And yet from that mixture of sinners, Christ saved so many, and they formed a local New Testament church. Amen. And uh, they could look back at the way that they once were, but now they had hope. And uh, in that hope, they're, they're, uh, there's a better tomorrow.
Pastor, tell us more about this hope for the LGBTQIA community, because earlier we talked about how being in this community and believing their ideology and their agenda um, puts you in direct opposition to God. You've got kids growing up in the community that don't know which way is up or down because they're confused about their own gender and they don't know who to call mom or dad. And there's also the, the, the confusion that comes with having so many genders and so many expressions. And it, it, it seems like a very bleak picture. And we talked about, you talked about how truth wins, uh, but it just seems like in that community, there is no truth. Uh, truth is whatever you want it to be. Truth is whatever I feel like it is. So it's so, it seems so hopeless. What, what hope is there for the LGBTQ Q community? If you could communicate to them and if they were all listening to this podcast, what would you say is, is well, their hope? Great question. I, I would, I would trace it to three things and I'd say that I have a biblical worldview. So the Bible tells me exactly how I got here. I was the product of an intelligent designer. He designed me for a purpose. So the Bible tells me how I got here. The Bible tells me why I'm here. There's no greater joy than to fulfill your destiny for Almighty God. So Philippians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul says to the church of Philippi, that he has forgotten those things which are behind, and he is pressing on to those things that are before. And the Bible says that he pressed towards the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. In other words, Christ created me. Christ has given me a purpose and the ultimate form of joy is the fulfillment of that purpose with my life. So there's only one me that's going to live in this world, me. And me fulfilling the purpose that God has created and designed me for is the place of ultimate joy. And then the third thing that I would tell you, the Bible tells us how we got here. The Bible gives us purpose and direction for our time here. And then the Bible says that one day I'll give an account to the Lord for how I've used this life. And that's where the Bible indicates that our joy will be full. So when we arrive home in heaven and we fulfill the purpose that he had for us here on the earth, then our joy will be full. And, and it is the greatest of, of commendations to hear from Almighty God that we had run the race well and that we finished successfully, and that God would say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And so uh, I wish that I could follow in the model of the Apostle Paul, where Christ testified that he had a plan for Paul's life, and Paul said, I will submit to that plan. And then the Apostle Paul said, there's no greater joy uh, than to have run my race. And, uh, and so... I would say that these folks that have chosen the alternate lifestyle are running in the opposite direction of God's best for their life. And they will run into a place of despair and tragic heartache, and they will wind up in a miserable way here on this side. And then, of course, they die in their sins without Christ and go into a, a, a godless eternity. How can they change that course? Well, that's, that's a great question. The Bible tells us that we've all been born in sin, but the Bible says that God commendeth, or he demonstrated to us, his love by sending Jesus Christ to die in our place. The Bible uses a long word called propitiation, but Jesus Christ is our substitute. That's what that word means. Jesus Christ took our place of punishment and died on the cross. And when I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, this is literally what happens. The burden of my sin is lifted. It is gone. And I will never face the punishment of that sin again. 
so the Bible says, he that believeth is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already. And the wrath of God abideth on him. And so it's very important for us to understand that before Christ and before salvation, we were on a collision course with damnation. But in our repentance and our trusting Jesus Christ alone for salvation, we can receive forgiveness of sins. And by the way, there's no better burden to be lifted than the burden of sin. And there's no better place to come than to the cross of Calvary and have Jesus forgive us. And and that's the, the testament that we would offer and the hope that we offer to all people. Pastor Todd, thank you for joining us on the Removing Barriers podcast. Thank you guys so much, and I pray that it will be greatly used. Thank you for listening. To get a hold of us or to support this podcast, go to anchor.fm forward slash removing barriers. This has been the Removing Barriers podcast. We attempted to remove barriers so that we all can have a clear view of the cross.